Welcome to Our Life in the Trinity. This is Linda Rex. Um, I'm bringing a sermon today for August 14th and proper 15th on the Christian calendar in the ordinary days. Um, today's gospel passage is Luke 12, 49 to 56. We'll start by reading that in the New American Standard Bible. We'll talk about our subject for today. And then we'll have um, communion together, and then we will close the benediction. But right now, I'd like to start with a prayer. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you that we can be in this space where we're with you and you're with us, and we're hearing from you, and we're speaking to you, and we have this conversation going on. We pray, Heavenly Spirit, that you will uh, write uh, the Father's Word on our heart more and more, and that uh, the living Word, Jesus Christ, can live more fully in us and through us. In his name we pray. Amen. So beginning in Luke 12, 49 to 56, it goes like this. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on, five members of one household will be divided, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided father against son, and son against father, and mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And he was also saying to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming. And so it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say it will be a hot day, and it turns out that way. You hypocrites, you know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and sky, but why do you not analyze this present time. You know, Jesus is talking to a group of people who refused to admit the reality of what was happening to them right there in that moment. They were being talked to by the one who was God in human flesh, but they did not want to grasp a hold of that. They had in their mind how it should be when the Messiah comes and he didn't fill that role and so they refused to believe and accept him for who he was. You know I've been thinking a lot about this uh, battle I'm going right now with with cancer that I'm dealing with and and God has been very gracious and very close to me through the whole experience and I've had so many wonderful people encourage me and pray for me and and offer me uh, such support, and I'm grateful. And there's this little side, though, you know, this sometimes when I'm feeling kind of tired or, or frustrated or, you know, sad, I heard the little voice say, you know, but what about all those prayers and anointings for healing that I received, you know? Doesn't God keep his promises? Now, I've had a lot of different... Uh, experiences in my life where God healed me. God brought me to himself, in fact, through a little healing that happened to me when I was a kid. And so I know that he intervenes and he keeps his word about answering our prayer and so on. But there are times, you know, where we have to wrestle with this, with this question of why isn't he saying yes to what I think is a reasonable request. And why isn't he keeping his word? Because he did say that if we ask, we'll receive, seek, we'll find, and so on. Well, one of the passages for um, this Sunday is in Hebrews 11. And those of you who are familiar with Hebrews 11 will know it's what we call the faith chapter because it's full of stories of how God intervened in the lives of people who trusted in him. And in this passage for today, it says how by faith, 
many people in the stories that we read in the Old Testament experienced God's powerful intervention in their lives and in their circumstances as they participated in what God was doing in the world. Um, many times they would ask God for things and he would deliver them. He would set them free. So in Hebrews 11, and this is the New American Standard Bible, in Hebrews 11, verse 29, it says, By faith they, and it's talking about the ancient nation of Israel, passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they'd been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not the harlot did not perish with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spy, spies in peace. And verse thirty-two. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon. Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. But then it, the whole tone of what the author is writing here changes, right? It goes from this by faith. They they did this impossible, amazing thing, or or this miracle that happened that was beyond expectation, right? But then in verse 35, it begins to change. Verse 36 says, and others. It doesn't say they had any less faith, does it? And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment, 37, they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword, and they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, <clears throat> 38 men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Wow. Wow, that's like a twist, isn't it? Verse 39 is really what caught, I mean, it catches our eye. It says this, And all these, having gained approval through their faith. Well, that's interesting. It wasn't that they didn't have faith, was it? They had faith. They gained God's approval through their faith. But look what happened to them. They did not receive what was promised. Whoa. Whoa. Isn't God a promise-keeping God? Well, absolutely. Well, how come they didn't see that we need to think about this? Verse 40, because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be perfect. So in the light of eternity now, now we begin to understand why they didn't receive the promises right then, right there in their life. Then we move on to chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance in the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that was set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of God, of the throne of God. 
So remember, in verse 39, we read, And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. You know, how could this be? I mean, why go through all these terrific experiences if they would never receive the promise? Well, the thing was, is they had their eyes on a bigger prize, right? All of our stories, whatever they may be, whatever it is that God takes us through in our life, are part of God's bigger story, his history, his story, his big story. He is the God who is love, who has swept us up into his life, and he has something he's doing in this world. And our temporary existence in this life is only a prelude to eternal union and communion with the Father, Son, and Spirit. If we're focused on this life and this life is all there is, that can be pretty depressing. And we can wonder what the meaning is for anything. What's the point? Right? But God, God sees things outside of our time. He lives in eternal time, which really isn't time. He lives in the eternal now, always present at every moment. The I am that I am. And for him, um, what we think is the end of everything is just a moment. And so we think about what God is doing. What God is doing is he created a self for relationship with him, warm fellowship with him, and he's bringing us into that. Our temporary existence, however long it is, 30 years, 40 years, 5 years, 100 years, however long it is, it's only a prelude to eternal union and communion with the Father through Jesus and the Spirit. This is just temporary. So Jesus come, you know, in this story we read in the uh, gospel, he was expressing his desire to, to get done what needed to be done to bring us into that place where we are forever with God in Christ in the Spirit. Jesus faced the crucifixion even though he begged the Father to be released from having to go through it. He faced it though with joy knowing what the ultimate result would be. He looked beyond his physical circumstance saying, oh, well, in order to accomplish what Abba wants to do in bringing us all together forever, this is what I have to do, and I'm willing to do it. You know, Jesus is the author of our faith, the perfecter of our faith. Whatever faith we have, it's insignificant and worthless apart from Christ's perfect faith and trust in his Father. I mean, his faith, faith in his father was so perfect and complete that he was willing to hang there and feel as though for once in his eternal existence separated from his father simply because he felt our our alienation that we project onto God he felt that he went into the depths with us to experience our total human experience. He was willing to go all the way through that. And yet you hear him in his final words saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He trusted that his father did not go anywhere. In fact, we read, God was in Christ. When he did this sacrifice for us. So we know the father hadn't gone anywhere. But by the spirit was present in the midst of the sacrificial offering. But Jesus felt our, our humanness. Our 
you know, all we, when we go through difficult, hard times, don't we often feel like we're having to go through it alone? That somehow God has abandoned us. Has God abandoned us? Not ever. God doesn't do abandonment. He doesn't do rejection. That's not his way. His way is like he did with Adam and Eve when they uh, took the wrong tree. What did he do? He went and found them and covered them with fur and uh, set them back on the road. Just basically saying, well, it looks like we're going to need to, I'm going to send your Savior. I mean, he, God pursued humanity all the way through. We see him going to Noah, going to Abraham, going to Isaac and Jacob, going to Moses, calling them to himself, bringing Israel into relationship with himself. God has come to get us every time we mess up. And he comes to us in Christ. And Christ is God in human flesh. And there hanging on the cross, he says to his father, into your hands I commit my spirit, because he had complete faith that his father was not going to leave him in the grave. Now there are times where God asks us for endurance and patience and perseverance. The only way we can do that is not by our strength. It is Christ in us by the Holy Spirit. This Christ who is willing to endure the cross for our sakes. Such incredible endurance and patience and perseverance. He was willing to do that. And he did, he did that because he knew that was the cost it would take for bringing all of humanity into relationship with the Father and the Spirit. You know, we read in Luke 12 in the gospel reading for today that um, Jesus longed to have the crucifixion over with, to get it done and behind him so that, I mean, because he knew what the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension meant for humanity. He knew we needed it done. And so he wanted to get it done. But he sure didn't want to do it in his flesh, right? In the same way, following Christ has a cost. And Jesus understands the cost because he went first. And he suffered what needed to be suffered. And even though he asked the Father to do it some other way, he went all the way. We hear him on the cross saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was quoting Psalm 22. If you read Psalm 22, I mean, back then the rabbis would begin the psalm and everyone would know how the rest of it went. They had memorized it. And you read Psalm 22 and right in the middle he says, He will not leave his afflicted. He will not forsake him. Jesus knew God. He knew God, his father's promises. He knew the scriptures. He knew God's word. But isn't it interesting that Jesus, the one with perfect faith in his father, even to the point of crucifixion and death, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Even he had to die and lay in the grave, didn't he? But he knew his father would not leave him there. His resurrection occurred after his death, right? There wouldn't be resurrection without death, right? Sometimes the cost of new life is death. And sometimes we have to die to things before we can experience new life. You know, I went on this kind of Jericho journey over at Fontenelle the other day. It's a beautiful um, mansion. It used to be home of Barbara Mandrell. And uh, they have a great uh, greenway where you can walk and so on. 
as I was walking along one day, um, I saw all the flowers or some in bloom, but there were others that had gone to seed. It was like the Spirit said to me, in the midst of death lie the seeds to new life. You think about that. You know, to us so often death is just this tragic end and it's heartrending and, you know, it breaks us up. But in every death, there's the seeds to new life. If we're willing to take them and plant them and nurture them. You know, in Christ's death, in his crucifixion, in his death, in his burial in that grave, and in his resurrection, we begin in seeds to our new life. He did everything that was needed for us to be brought home to the Father, to have an intimate relationship with God, warm fellowship with God now and forever. When we look at Jesus, look at the extent he was willing to go through to get us to that place, to be with the triune God forever. We find in Jesus the seeds to our new life. You know, for a moment in this life, we may be experienced what we think are God's unkept promises. But those unkept promises may very well be his offering to us of something greater, more wonderful, more eternal. We need to see things from God's point of view. God has a perspective that we don't have. Instead of focusing on the loss or the difficulty or the suffering, perhaps we need to suffer. focus on our Lord Jesus Christ. Focus on him. Let God be who God is. God is our loving father. He does care for us and want what's best for us. He doesn't like to see us suffer. When we cry, he feels our pain because Christ has been there. Christ knows suffering. He knows pain. He knows loss. And God's purpose is to bring us all to new life, to a new place, a place where we're in warm fellowship with him now and forever. That's his desire and his purpose for whatever we're going through. And yeah, it's not a pleasant thought to think, oh, you know, that we may die or that someone we love may die or they have died and we have to grieve their loss. These are painful and difficult things, but we're never ever alone. And our God understands. He is, he has felt that pain. He has felt that loss. He knows what it's like and he will never leave or forsake us but will be with us to the end. And ultimately his promises will be kept, though maybe in a way we didn't plan on or expect. And that's sometimes we have to surrender to God and his will and his purposes for it all begins and ends with him anyway. And that brings us to our communion table today. You know, we affirm the essentials of our faith. We died with Christ. We rose with Christ. We share in his glory both now and forever. And as we uh, take the bread and the wine um, or juice, um, we give thanks because God's gift to us is so so profound. His gift to us is himself. He gives us himself not only in Jesus' self-offering, but in the gift of the Holy Spirit so that Christ comes to dwell within. And in him dwelling in us by the Spirit, the Father comes to dwell. We have a close, warm relationship with God now and forever. God has done this for us in Christ. So we receive anew this precious, precious gift. Let us pray. 
thank you for all you've done, Lord, for your goodness and love and your faithfulness. Grant us the grace to trust you, even when it seems that there is no way that you're going to keep your word to us. Enable us to see beyond our human temporary life into the life we have with you now and forever in Christ by the Spirit. Remind us of your love for us and your faithfulness. Through Jesus our Lord. Amen. And Jesus offered on the night he was betrayed um, the bread. He said, take you, this is my body broken for you. We thank you, Jesus, for your broken body for us. Jesus also offered the uh, cup that night. He said, take this, drink it. This is my blood shed for you. I think about Jesus being willing to pour his life out for us. Um, and he did so freely. Jesus, we receive your life for our life. Thank you. Now may God smile on you as you call in Jesus' name. May you be revived, restored, and saved. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, God bless you. I hope to see you again here on Our Life in the Trinity. And if you are interested in maybe gathering together with others um, of like mind and have a study group of some kind, um, drop me a line at our life in the Trinity at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. And um, do have a great week. God bless you.